Thank you, dear Lorelei. It's so wonderful to be here with you again. Um, I feel like I'm coming home when I come here. You know, I was part of City when it used to meet in the Ferndale School. And so I, it, it was a long journey for me here with City. And the only reason I left City was because we had moved to Bryanston. And because I worship on my own and I wanted to be, belong to a life group and go out at night and all those things, I needed to be worshiping in my community. And so I moved to a community and a church closer to where we live. But that was the only reason. I love this place. I visit here um, from time to time. I've seen some of you. For those of you who, who's meeting me for the first time today? Can I just see a show of hands? I just want to do an audience check here. So there are a few of you, great. Welcome, welcome. If I haven't met you, I hope I'll get the opportunity after this morning. It's really a privilege to be here. Who of you are here for a second helping of this talk? Because um, this is the talk I delivered on the Thursday. Uh, a few, uh, there's quite a few of you. Okay, I... Uh, well, you know that the Lord always shows up differently, and you need to know that I'm not here for my story. I'm here for His. And if anything else comes across in my, my preach today, my, my chat with you women today, I ask you to forgive me because it isn't about me. It is about this incredible, almighty, powerful, wonderful God that we serve whom I have come to know in a very real and a very personal way, and guess how, through the challenges of my life. And so, yeah, I'm going to hopefully share some of that story of God's goodness so that at the end of an event like this, you too will be able to say, okay, Lord, when James says, count it all joy when you face all kinds of various trials that you won't say, oh, he must have been smoking something. You'll be able to say, I can because I know the one who lives in me who helps me to do that. So that's what we're going to be spending some time on today. I'm so excited always to share the testimony of God's goodness in my life. Can I just see who's married here? Can I see the marrieds, all married? Singles? Singles, we've got a few singles, okay. Um, children, moms, most moms. Okay, so when I, I just, I'm just trying to say, because, you know, when I talk about the trials of life, I need to know what, what areas I'm going to be looking at. Those of you who are not working but wish you were working, a few, okay. And those of you who are working and wish you weren't working, <laughs> you shouldn't be here then. Okay, how many of you here have had moments or seasons in your life that you've been absolutely stressed out, that you have just thought, no, no? Yeah, if, it, is there anyone here who's never had that place? Because <laughs> then you actually should be doing the talk, not me. Okay, so what does that look like? What does it look like when you're stressed? To, you know, Things sounds like some of these things. We we say things like, I'm always busy. Isn't that right? I'm, I'm always striving to get, or I'm not good enough. Aren't those some of the signs that we're not balanced in our lives? You know, I'm too busy. I haven't got time for God. But you know what? Quiet time. Who has that? I'm a mom, you know. Nobody has that kind of thing. There's no peace. For people who are usually stressed. We're constantly seeking the next best thing that will give me that inner peace. We're striving to earn approval from others. Very um, strong amongst women. We're always comparing ourselves to other women. And ladies, social media has exacerbated that beyond words. I heard that there's a new diagnosis for people who do this comparison thing so intensely because they've, they've got predisposition to um, 
ADHD and other dis uh, orders like that, you know, op uh, uh, compulsive, obsessive disorders and those kind of things, that they, they take on this diagnosis. And I, I wasn't listening to the whole program. I just heard the title and I thought, a doctor has now diagnosed and given a new name to this thing called I can't accept myself because of my comparisons with others on social media. And it was called something like dysmorphosis of your body. It, I, I mean, and you know, I remember hearing years ago that in 2020, 84% of the sicknesses we'll suffer from, of the jobs we will perform, had not even been named yet. Well, I'm living through that era now because we're in that season where new things are coming out because of the stressed lives we live. But it's impatient, you know, road rage. How many of you, you know, sit at robots and say, go? Maybe you say it a bit differently to that, and, and you have new fingers that appear on your hands. But we're also not present. You know, we've become a society that's so not present. We're always on our phones. We're always checking. Is somebody checking up on me, or need me, or sent me a mail, or connected with me? Because that's become the conditioning that we have been um, given through our, the lifestyles we're living at the moment. We lack sleep, we're tired all the time, we're irritable, we're short-tempered, we're unhealthy, making poor food choices, we lack exercise, we don't eat right. Stress always means a boundary is being eroded. So if any of those were any part of your life, then you're probably at the right place because I'm talking to women who, like me, have found themselves in that place sometimes. Now, I don't know your life. I don't know the stresses that you've struggled. I don't know the pain in your life. I don't know the sickness in your life. But there are two things I do know. The one thing is, I know the one who created you, and I know the one who says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. I know him. He tells us that if you live in this world and you allow that conditioning in this world, He's saying, you're going against what I'm telling you to do if you want to have a peaceful life. So do not be conformed. I also know the one who said, and it's Jesus himself who said, these were his words, the devil comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life. And not did he, he didn't stop there. He said, and have it more abundantly. And so ladies, he's the one who created you. He's the one who offers you that life of abundance. Now, I don't know about you, but a, an abundant life doesn't look like one that struggles every day. Don't you agree? And that's a promise. Jesus spoke it with his own mouth. Those are the promises in our lives today that we need to grasp a hold of and take possession of in our hearts so that we too can be transformed, not conformed to the patterns of this world. And I also know that my own life, in the difficult times, and I will share some of those with you, how faithful God has been, and how lovingly and gently and kindly He has taught me when I'm off track to get back on, back on track and follow in his ways. And you know that even when I'm not faithful and when I'm disobedient and when I'm in sin and when I'm in doubt and when I'm in unbelief, he remains faithful. What a good God we serve. The other thing I need to assure you of is that no one gets through life unscathed. Not a single person. You know, even those ones that you might follow on Instagram, you know, the, they gram those pictures. Or on Facebook, and it looks like she's got the perfect life. I remember somebody saying to me one day, 
how have you got it all together? I said, honey, if you only knew. I haven't got anything together. But the one who lives in me is what keeps me together. And so, yeah, in my life, nobody, I know now that nobody goes through life without trials. And how do I know that? I know that because the word of truth tells me that. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, Jesus, again, his words, I love his words. They're in red in my Bible. I love them. He said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you will have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? For who overcame the world? Not you and me. Jesus, he said, "For be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And so, ladies, we are assured of that. That is a promise. So even if it looks like someone's got their lives together, know that they haven't, but maybe they have the one who does keep things together, and that's Jesus. And so that really is the question. And I think Laura Lay even started today by asking, if there's anyone here and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you. If you have never said, you know what, I don't even know if you're real, but today I want to say, come, come and live in me. Because for all of us, there needs to be that day. So some of my tribulations, and I, I mean, I, I only have until quarter past, so I couldn't possibly share them all. I'm, my life has been too long, you know, to, to have all the tribulations, but I try to kind of package them into groups. And then, the f so the first trial I want to share with you is, is the trial of my marriage. Now, I've been married for 42 years. In fact, last Tuesday, we celebrated our anniversary. Why did I call it a trial? Well, ladies, I got saved. I'd committed my life to the Lord for the first time in November, November of 1977, but I had married in May of that year. So I had married before I had actually given my life to Jesus. And then I got saved, and I started finding out things like, don't be unequally yoked, and I thought, oh, there's a goodie. I could just sneak out if it doesn't work, you know? But I also learned about all the other promises in the Bible. Why has my marriage been a challenge? Because ladies, for 42 years, I've loved and stayed married to a good man who's not yet a God man. And that's made every other area of our lives tough. Let's face it. But let me tell you the scripture, ladies, for those of you who are in relationships with, with ungodly men and you're married, you don't get divorced. That's not God's plan. He's going to use that man as sandpaper to mold you. Let me tell you, I'm so grateful for my marriage because I wouldn't be half the woman I am today, having made nearly the changes I've had to make and stay married. I'm grateful for the challenge of that. But this is what the scripture was that, that says to me, I know I'm in the right place. Because he's the love of my life. In um, 1 Peter 3, it says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even some who do not obey the word, they without a word. Sorry, I have to put my glasses on. Sorry. Sorry. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. And you know, it isn't a scripture I've memorized. I've memorized much scripture, but I haven't memorized that one. Because for me, that one means every single action in my house. I can't walk around saying, wives, well, submit to your husbands, even those who are not in the Lord, because they might be wives. I can't do that. I've got to walk around and saying, yes, Lord, I'm going to submit to him regardless, in every way, because maybe one day 
Maybe one day he'll be won over. And I've had much disappointment in that. As you can imagine, I've prayed for my husband for 42 years, ladies. And I won't stop. And I prayed again this morning. And you know that lots has changed. And that's why I tell you, he's a good man. But one day, and I have that promise, and I hang on to that promise, because God gave me the promise, me and my house, we will serve the Lord, which means before my husband dies, he will give his life to the Lord. He knows exactly what's going to happen, and he's going to be serving the Lord. I know that. I have that promise. I hold on to it with all I have. But it's not in my time, and it's not going to be my way. I just mustn't be the stumbling block for God to work. And I think at times I have been. I've taken, I've dragged him along to church, kicking and screaming. You know, some of you have seen him here. And then he would um, stand with his hands in his pockets, and he wouldn't sing a thing. And, and I'd say, but Lord, you had your chance <laughs> as we would go home, you know. I'm sure you, for those of you who've been in a relationship like that, you'll know. And even if it's not your husband, if there's someone in your family, I just want to say to you, put them at the altar. Put them at the feet of Jesus and say, have your way and help me to be an instrument that takes him closer, not draws him further away. So as a result of that, obviously parenting was very difficult. You know, um, for some of you, you know, we weren't even in the same book, never mind on the same page, okay? When I was trying to get help on parenting from the Word of God, he was looking in the You magazine, and that was like, okay? So bringing up children, making decisions around our children and the way they should live and be in their lives, you know, it was, it was awkward at times. Our finances... There were very difficult months in our early part of our marriage. And it's difficult to have faith and to give when you're in lack and you're the only one. I used to have to sneak money from the housekeeping that he would share with me to put into the offering basket because that's how I learned through the act of obedience to get into a relationship with God that said, I'll show you how to learn to be a cheerful giver. But for us, finances was very difficult. Where to invest? Do we store up treasures here on earth where moth and rust sets in? Or do we build treasures in heaven? I want to build treasures in heaven. But it, that takes lots of negotiation. And so we've had to have lots of conversations around those things. And then my career, I've probably had to reinvent myself four times throughout my working career because I qualified as a nursing sister, but I got into business sort of within three years of my qualification because Kevin couldn't stand the, the shift work, you know. They put me on six weeks of night duty straight after we were married. And when I said to the matron, but I'm a newlywed, you know, we just come back from honeymoon. She said, honey, if your marriage survives this, it'll survive anything. And she was right, because we have, but it actually was one of the things that made me change my career. But so was a lack of finances. And so I did. I did four very different things throughout my career. But in 1992, Kevin and I had made a decision. We would take all of our saved finances and invest it in a business. Um, and I was going to build that business but I would be an owner of the business. And so I was the co-owner, I invested in it, I built a very successful organization over a period of nine years, um, winning lots of awards, and, but because of a broken relationship in that business, after nine and a half years as the chief executive, I had to walk away from that business with nothing. And I had to trust God that one day there'd be a return on investment. And there was, but it took five years, five years of weeping before the Lord saying, this is not fair, you know, you know those conversations you sometimes have with God. He honors those, but he is faithful to his word. And when he saw I had completely let go of the idol of money and status, he restored what the locust had stolen. 
But it took five years of work in me for that restoration to come. For most of us, we give up. And then my health. In 2017, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I underwent two surgeries, um, six weeks of daily radiation therapy. And now I'm on oral chemotherapy for five years. How on earth can we get through life with these kind of stresses? And those are only some of them, ladies. I have two married daughters now, happily married to the most wonderful sons God has given us, and nine grandchildren. But you know, as your season changes, for those of you that are grandparents in the room, you'll know. I, I spend more time praying for my grandchildren and my children to be better parents than I ever spend praying for myself as a parent. But that's good news, because I want to be known as a praying grandmother. So what did life look like for me when I was stressed and in balance? Well, until I received revelation from God that He has and is the answer and has promises to everything, I just bumbled along. I didn't know the truth. I went to church on a Sunday. I joined a life group. I hoped to get a fix you know, somebody would say, I've got a word for you, you know. I would have loved somebody like Elvira in my life group. And she comes with a word. She hears the Spirit. But in those days, folks, I couldn't hear God speaking to me because I wasn't listening. God was speaking, but I wasn't listening. And I didn't know the truth. So what is truth? What is this truth I'm talking about? Well, Jesus says in John 14 verse 6, he says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the truth. It also tells us in John, the first chapter of the Gospel of John, it starts in chapter 1, and, and Jesus, we, he's, John is talking about Jesus the man, and he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And then in verse 14 it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. Who is that? Who is truth? His name is Jesus. And we need to get to know that that is the truth. And everything he says and everything that's written about him in this book is truth, ladies. Everything else around us is fact or is opinion or is our thoughts this is the truth of God's word. And unless we settle that, that this is the uncompromised truth, Jesus himself, who came in the flesh and spoke to us on how to live life. So we, what do we do with this? And, and how did this actually play out in my life? What changed for me? Well, I had an experience in a and b in, in Port Elizabeth when I woke up one morning, my phone hadn't gone off, and I was frantic, and I, my phone had died, and I couldn't get hold of my, ki my husband. I, my kids were already out of the house, but I was on a business trip, and I was training that day, and how on earth was I actually going to get through the day without connectivity? And ladies, in that state of frenzy and me running around the room with my heart pounding and my palms sweating, God spoke to my heart as if he was in the room with me that day. And he said, I wish you would reach for me first thing in the morning and rely on me like you do on your phone because I will never die on you. I wish you were this frantic and worried when you couldn't connect with me. I have never left you a voicemail. Ladies, don't get me wrong. God had spent many, many moments in my life speaking to me and speaking to my heart. But this one was different. And how do I know it was different? Because it became a defining moment for me. You know what a defining moment is? It's those moments in our lives where we talk about, well, before that experience, 
life was like this, and now, since that experience, life was like this. And for sustainable change in our lives, ladies, we need some defining moments with Jesus. And that was one of them. And the, the defining moment for me that had to change was I had to stop reaching for technology first thing in the morning. And you know that since that day, to this day, before I put my foot on the ground, I welcome the Holy Spirit into my life and into my day. Otherwise, I'm not doing the day. I can do without the phone, but I can't do without Jesus. And so, that's probably a challenge for some of us, is what are we reaching for? And then, probably the most significant defining moment of recent times was in August of 2016. It was my 60th birthday, and for my birthday, one of my friends had given me the most amazing book to read called 558 Days. It's a book by Yolanda Corky. Her and her husband, Pierre Corky, had... Um, it's her recollection of their story of time in captivity as hostages in Yemen. Her and Pierre, her husband, had gone there as missionaries and to teach English. And they were captured by Al-Qaeda. And you know, that book was a wonderful read. But there was one section of the book that really impacted me. And, and the section was where they shared that as believers in captivity... Without a Bible, they could remember very few scriptures. And yet, in the room next door to them, which was divided by a curtain only, they could hear their captors reciting the Quran day and night. I felt deeply convicted when I read that piece of the book. It was such a Holy Spirit moment. And I thought, you know, if I was ever in captivity without a Bible, gosh, I don't think I'd do so well either. And so I felt impressed in my heart those Holy Spirit defining moments where the Lord said, I want you to memorize Scripture. Now, remember, I'm 60. I thought, you've got to be joking, Lord. And you know that as soon as that thought came up, the Lord reminded me, there is a promise in his Bible that says, therefore, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. All things, that means my mind, my speech, my body, the way I look, the way I am, everything can become new if I receive that promise. When I'm in Christ, I'm a new creation. That means I, of course I can, sorry, I'm obviously spitting. And, and so I decided, ladies, to start learning scripture. I learned in the year of 2017, I learned one scripture from every book of the Bible. And do you know, it was such a wonderful, wonderful experience because I started learning the scripture just after I'd finished the book in November. And so November and December and January, and January was one of my goals to read, to, to learn one from every book of the Bible. So by January and February, I was kind of into my fourth scripture and getting quite excited about what was happening. Ladies, little did I know that my personal captivity would come on the 23rd of February, 2017. It wasn't physical, no. Al-Qaeda didn't get me. A thing called cancer took hold of my body. I believe that every one of us sitting in this room are held captive by some things in our life. We're all held captive by something. For some, it's our work. For some, it's alcohol. For some, it's drugs. For some, it's our kids. For some, it's our husbands. For some, it's our phones, pornography, fears. We are all held captive by something that is bigger in our lives than God. And ladies, 
anything that holds us captive and holds us in bondage is our personal captivity. For some of us, it's our pain. My encouragement to you today is that help is available, and we find it in the truth of God's Word. His Word tells us in 2 Peter 1, 3, by His divine power, by His divine power, He has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. That's a promise. But because we don't know these promises as much as we know what the report said or what the doctor said, my story is that on the 23rd of February, when I was diagnosed with stage two invasive mammary duct carcinoma, it became a real defining moment in my life. You know those moments, the before and after, from being a healthy, fit, and well individual to having a disease that would affect every single thought, word, and decision from here on out, and not only for me, but for everybody who was close to me. I'm not going to give you the details, and I would be lying if I told you that it was without emotion. I felt every emotion when that dark cloud of loss would come over me, of my pain and my anguish at what I was facing would come over me. I was overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. Often anger because of the loss. But like you, I too had a choice before me every single day. And that was, am I going to fo focus on the facts of what's happened to me or on the truth of what God says about me? I'm going to say that again. Ladies, are we going to focus on the facts before us every single day in our lives and the conditioning that is bombarding us every single day? Or are we going to focus on the truth of God's word? I chose that even in the uncertainty, I was going to focus on the truth of God's word. We were going to speak life as a family we were going to pray the word, we were going to speak the word, and we were going to live because Jesus has overcome. He said, be of good cheer. Remember, I reminded you in the beginning, I have overcome the world. This is one of those tribulations, one of those pressings, one of those anxieties. And so <clears throat> what did I need to do? Well, the first scripture that God gave me John 8, verse 31, Jesus is speaking again, and he says, if you abide in my word, not Google, not Facebook, not the latest woman's magazine, not the greatest marketing information, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you you free. I didn't know that truth as intimately then as I do today. <clears throat> to abide, ladies, means to remain in, to stay connected to. So what does this look like in my life now? Well, my greatest regret is that I'm actually quite a slow learner. I've missed out on so much of the abundance of God and the goodness that He could have given me. In fact, He gave me I just didn't know how to receive it. For too long, I listened to the wrong words. I used to remember the words of the songs, you know, when we were young and jiving. For those of you my age, you know, I will survive. You know that one? It's raining men. Hallelujah. You know, I bet you also know all those songs. Yeah, of course you do. How dare we then say, we can't remember the truth of God's word. And that's the conviction for me, is that I can remember, I can remember as far back as high school days when a teacher told me I would never amount to much. And do you know that as I was 
progressing in my walk with Jesus, he kept saying to me, but you know the scripture. You know the 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells you. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, she is a new creation. I'm a new I'm not that girl anymore. And ladies, for some of you, Maybe it's time to let go that thing, that baggage, that bondage, that chain. It's heavy. You can't live an abundant life holding on to the heaviness and the bondage that holds you back. My memory is renewed. My health is renewed. I've chosen to memorize the truth of God's word, and I've chosen to make the truth of God's word speak louder than my facts that I face in my life, every day. And you can too. You know, the other day I, I was woken up at 2.30 in the morning and I was anxious and my kids were on my mind. My one daughter lives on a plot and, you know, it's, it's out in the open and security's always been quite a big issue for me around them and their lives there. And God has really made me lay that down and say, you know what, I know you love her, but I love her more. And so, but you know, I found a scripture in Isaiah 54, 13. And you know what that scripture says? It says, all my children are taught by the Lord. And great will be the peace of my children. And so, in my bed that night, I'm lying there. And I'm praying in the spirit. And I'm saying, Jesus, help me. But the good news is, I could pray that scripture, Lord, thank you that my children are taught by the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that great is the peace of my children. And yes, Lord, I come against any weapon the enemy has because your word tells me no weapon formed against me will prosper. And so, ladies, in, in preparation for today, I thought, well, how can I actually help you in this? How can I say to you, how do you start this? Well, you can start with one Scripture from each book, find one that works for you. But, you know, there's 66 books of the Bible. There's another way, a way that I have found, and, and the other day I shared it with a friend of mine. I said, you know, when I lie awake at, in bed at night, I do the ABCs now. I've now learned a scripture that starts with every one of the letters of the alphabet. So it just keeps growing, and it's so fun because there I lie awake, and I say, hey, and we know all things work together for the good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purposes, purposes Romans 8, 28. And then I go to B, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. And I go through the whole thing because I know it all, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And then I say, Lord, I'm lying awake here. I receive that peace here and now, Lord. And then see, come unto me, all who labor on are heavy laden. And what will I do? I'll give you rest. Roman, uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight. And then I get to D, do not be conformed. And then I get to E, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. And it's a and you know that I don't often get beyond E because I'm asleep. Because by then I've prayed through whatever was keeping me awake. You know, I used to suffer from panic attacks. And ladies, it can be the most debilitating thing for women who are in anxiety and panic attacks and depression and all those things. I want to say to you, you don't need to keep that bondage. You need to get free because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So, my question to you is, what do you reach for first thing in the morning? Matthew 6.33 tells us to seek first the kingdom of God, the first book of the New Testament, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. My next question to you is, when you are stressed and imbalanced, and you know it, what are you speaking with your mouth? Because in Mark 11, verse 22, Jesus tells us to have faith in God. Because assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, will have whatever he says. 
what are you saying? You are speaking your destiny into existence, ladies. I want you to guard what comes out of your mouth. Luke tells us to ask, to knock. My question is, when you are in a place and you're seeking answers, who are you asking? Are you asking friends? Are you following, you know, even wonderful role models? They're not God. They're not Jesus. And sometimes, folks, we need to just take our focus off our idols and we need to say, Jesus, you give me the answer. You know, the word is alive and powerful and there's a beautiful scripture um, in Hebrews that tells us that. But ladies, you're here today, I believe, because you want change for you, for your life. Maybe you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Maybe this bumble along, just getting by life is enough. I've had enough. I'm overwhelmed. I want to say to you that if you abide in the word, you are truly a Christ follower. Jesus says, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth. We know God uses the good, the bad, and the ugly of our lives. All of it. Because in Romans 8, he says, all things. He doesn't say, I'm going to use the good things. I'm going to use the some things. In Romans 8, 28, it says, all things work together for good. That is the good, the bad, and the ugly of our lives. Like you, I'm challenged every day in the way I live my life as a believer. I'm challenged by what is my profession of faith? When I open my mouth, do I talk about my faith in Jesus, my Savior, my Lord? Or do I talk about the things that I've been reading in reports or the opinions of others? The wonderful news is that change can come and it can come for all of us today through the power of His Spirit. So what now? I want to give you a few practical things. I think the first thing I'd like to suggest to you is that you pray and you ask the Holy Spirit. And we're going to do that at the end. But I, if you want like the five-step plan, because I think some of you here are structured and five-steppers, you know, that's cool. I'm one of those. Start by praying and asking the Holy Spirit to give you his wisdom in your circumstances. So be prayerful. Because again, in the word of God in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, he says, my grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in weakness. His grace is sufficient. I am testimony to that. The second thing I suggest you do is that you find one scripture that speaks truth over your life and circumstances, your trials, your pain, your disease, your, your relationships. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> and then I want to encourage you, just one scripture. Start with one. Write it. Read it. Learn it. Sing it, move with it, dance to it, but speak it over yourself every day, every time you think of that circumstance. <clears throat> Number four, guard your heart. By that I mean guard what comes into your heart through your senses, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth. That's what gets into your heart and by what you, you touch and do. Those are your five senses. God, what comes in there? Folks, stop listening to the radio. Listen to Jesus on audio Bible. It's fabulous. If you don't like the one voice, pick another one. There are many. I've got lots. Listen to the things that are going to edify you and grow you and build you. Be careful of the opinions of others. 
And then number five, watch your tongue. Watch what you speak about your future, about your circumstances. When God says in Mark eleven twenty two, have faith in God, he's saying have faith in God. Even when the doctor's report comes out, even when the, the, somebody says this is dead, it's not going anywhere. My God says, I set before you blessing and cursing, life and death. Now choose life. We need to choose it. It's a choice. And then my last overarching thing for the five steps is choose the truth over the facts on every count. I believe a balanced life is one that is lived in the fruit of the Spirit, and we find that in Galatians 6. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The question is, how much of that fruit do we show the world when we're in a stressed state? In closing, I want to share God's truth in action in my life just in the last four months. I've had the most incredible four months with Jesus once again. So in January this year, I decided to learn a, my um, scripture for January was from Proverbs 4, verse 20 to 22. And this is how it goes. It says, my daughter, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let, let, let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. <clears throat> Isn't that beautiful? Oh, I love that. I know that. And that I can say, your words, Lord, that I've got in my heart, they are health to my flesh and they are life to my body, and that's wonderful. And that was January. For those of you who know, cancer survivors have to go for six monthly checkups, and my six month checkup was on the 15th of January. Um, my oncologist, when she saw me, was not happy with some of her findings on the mammogram and the chest x ray that they did. I had developed a bulge on my left side, and they needed to start investigating. And so on the 24th of January, I had a bone scan. And on Monday, the 28th of January, we got the call from the doctor to say, please come in for your results. And I said, you know, you can give them to me on the phone. And she said, no, you need to come in. And you know when a doctor says that. Folks, my test of faith on that journey was, my daughter, give attention to my words. I needed to remember those words. We got to the doctor on the 28th of January, and the cancer had spread to my bones. I had cancer in my fourth, my fifth, and my eighth rib. And for some of you, in the, if you come to this church, you may know the Ocean Song by Bethel Music. And the words to that song, I had been singing in January. I love that song, and so I've got it on my phone, and whenever I'm in my car, and it says... Take me deeper where my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And I'm thinking, sure, Lord, you really are testing me. And he said, yeah, did you mean those words? Did you mean it when you said, Lord, where, take me where my trust is without borders, where we'll walk upon the waters? Did you believe what you were singing about when you were singing that to him. I was singing it to him. And I said, yes, Lord, I did. And I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you for health in this situation. On Tuesday the 29th, so that next morning, we had to see the medical oncologist. And he's the guy that tells you what uh, medicin me medicines they're going to give you, what um, chemotherapy. And he said to me, look, before we start the chemo, we need to do a few more scans because I need to see that it hasn't gone beyond the bones 
into the organs of the body because it's a different chemotherapy for bone cancer to organ cancer. So that was on Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock, and I remember coming home and sending out the message to my faith prayer warriors saying, you need to pray with me that I will not get into doubt and unbelief. I'm standing on the word for a miracle. I believe my God has overcome cancer in me. He's told me I don't have to do this journey again. I haven't sinned and fallen short so badly that I, have to, that I didn't pass the test on round one. And I came home and my daughter called and said, Mom, can I come and have tea? And I said, sure. And she arrived, no kids in tow. And I said, where are the kids? She said, no, I haven't come here to, for you to see the kids. I've come here to pray, Mom. I want to know, do you have faith for a miracle? I said, you bet. That day, <laughs> Meryl and I prayed that God would overcome. And even after the prayer, I had to repent of my doubt and unbelief. Because in the flesh, ladies, it's tough. I know that. But we serve a loving, gracious, merciful Father. And we begged and we wept before him. And we praised his holy name. That no matter what, that he would give us more grace. Because his grace is always sufficient. We kept standing on the truth of God's word. On the, I had two scans, follow-up scans. I had a CT scan on the 30th, which was the next day. And then I had an MRI scan on Monday, the 4th of February this year. I stayed in the truth. God is amazing. I would sit in the MRI waiting list uh, waiting room, and I'd be reading magazines because they had some joy magazines and some other. And the articles were all about faith in God and Jesus and what He's done for us. And if we just learn how to receive what He has done for us. And they said to me after the MRI scan, please don't go. You need to take your results because we don't deliver to the Donald Gordon, to the oncology unit. So will you wait for your results? I said, yes, yeah, sure. But could you just give me both then at the same time? I thought, this is my opportunity. I get to see them before the docs do. And so I waited. I went and had a cup of coffee, praising the Lord. Got into my car, prayed, and said, Lord, thank you that no matter what, you're with me. You're in control. No matter what. But I know you can do a miracle. And ladies, I, I can't tell you these results. I have to read them because the, the medical terms. But in my bone scan, the results stated there is evidence of metastases in the left anterior lateral, fourth, fifth, and left posterior eighth rib. That was the first result. The second result was the CT scan, which said no evidence of any bony metastases found, only scar tissue. And the final MRI scan, no metastatic lesions are detected with any, any organs. Lymph adenopathies are not noted. God is good. God is always good. God is always faithful to his word. We aren't always, but he's always faithful to his word, ladies. And finally, I want to leave you with Romans 8.35. Paul's writing to these Romans, and he says, What shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? And it goes on to all the things. Can any of that? And then in verse 38, he says, For I am persuaded. Are you persuaded? That neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come in your life, ladies, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate you from the love of God that he has for you.
What an exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think God he is. Amen.